Jones here, we're Brigade Boats, and in today's video, we're gonna take this battleship and turn it from two frame to insane with the craziest build that we've done yet on this channel. Stick around, I'm gonna show you the entire overhaul step by step in this video. The project started life as an 1852 low Big John, and this boat is a battleship compared to the boats I built previously here on the channel. The boat owner, Kerry, started this project on his own. Upon getting to the framing stage, the magnitude of the project had escalated to the point that the labor hours and skill set required were not feasible for him to continue, so he turned the boat over to me to complete his vision. Kerry self-described himself as a loud guy. He likes things that are against the grain, outside the box, over the top, custom, unique, one of a kind. Well, he came to the right place. The goal of this project was to complete a truly one-of-a-kind John Boat to Bass Boat build designed specifically for Kerry's needs to fish electric-only bass tournaments here in Georgia. We have many electric-only reservoirs and lakes, and this boat will be used to target bass and those fisheries. This video documents the entire build process from start to finish. I'll walk you through what I did and how I did it in the order I did it in. There's a full parts list in the video description for anyone interested in any of the parts I used in this build. For any purchases made on tinyboatnation.net, use the code BRIGADE at checkout and save 5% off your entire order. We are on the road to 50K, so if you want to help us out, join the channel. If you enjoy the content, hit that subscribe button. I greatly appreciate every single one of my subs. Spring is here, and there's no better place to gear up for warmer days ahead than SixCentsFishing.com. Six Cents just released their brand new old timer series. These are retro style rope hats inspired by days past with modern colorways and materials. They're also your home for all their performance wear and UPF 50 sun shirts. Go on over to sixcentsfishing.com, use the code brigade at checkout and save 10% off your entire order. And don't forget to check out my friends at Waterland Fishing Optics. Head on over to waterlandco.com, use the code brigade at checkout and save 15% off your entire order there. Back to the video. Most people have heard the saying, money can't buy happiness, but it can buy me a boat. With this project, that is especially true. By looking at the boat, it is no secret that it came with a significant cost. But in Kerry's defense, that was not always the plan. I honestly, when I first started this, I had no intentions of going this extreme, but this is Division Plus 1000, I guess you could say. Brigade Beast is about to be unleashed. <laughs> <laughs> This is the wildest boat build I've done yet here on the channel, and going from mild to wild comes with a cost, which also makes this the most expensive project I've done on the channel. Parts add up, and this boat has a lot of parts. Custom rotter sea deck, two-stage exterior vinyl wrap, two Minn Kota talons, three fish finders with live scope, five lithium batteries, a 36-volt trolling motor, and an electric outboard. But even with the best parts, they wouldn't do a project justice without craftsmanship, detail, and execution. Speaking of which, this boat was sandblasted, tube frame, professionally painted, features a tournament live well, a massive cooler, aluminum decking, powder-coated lids, dual rod lockers, pour foam, a custom switch panel, and tons of electronics wired in. What you'll see in this video is the culmination of hundreds of labor hours and many companies' efforts to create arguably one of the most highly modified John Boat builds documented here on YouTube. I am especially proud of this boat. If you've been around long enough to follow my journey, then you probably understand why. Years ago, I started my channel with DIY-centered content, building my first John Boat out of plywood and cheap Home Depot carpet. This boat may be a dream machine to carry, 
but it was once a dream of mine to build boats of this caliber from my garage. From a hobby to a full-time business, I hope that my evolution of projects can inspire others to pursue their passion, whatever it may be. Before we get into the build, I'd like to answer a couple questions I know I'm going to get about this project. Biggest question I typically get, what is the cost? And I will leave you guys a bit disappointed on this one. In respect for all my customers' personal financial decisions, I have never disclosed build totals on my YouTube channel. Most of my build videos get hundreds of thousands of views, and with that, cost can attract attention from people who believe it is their duty to tell other people how to spend their money. I believe a man's money is his business and his business alone, and because of that, I don't air out numbers on my customers' projects for the world to see. I hope you guys can understand. It wasn't intended to be a bunch of money, but it ended up being a bunch of money. If you have a budget, stick by your budget because don't keep reaching in the bank and then putting more stuff on there if you ain't got it. So now I'm eating bread and water, but I got a sweet looking boat, so. Next, why not just buy a new boat? Given the cost, you aren't totally wrong for asking. In fact, it's a feasible option for most people, but Kerry and my other customers aren't most people. They see the value in having something handcrafted specifically for them. The art of the transformation of an old boat, sometimes sentimental, into a one-off machine built for battle. The mystique and experience of working together throughout the process to creatively design and fabricate a boat catered for their wants and needs. Not something you're just going to run out and pick up from the local Bass Pro Shop for 20 to 30 grand. And not that there's anything wrong with that, but if everybody did that, the world would be a pretty boring place. You wouldn't be watching this video and my channel wouldn't exist. All right, guys, now that we got through all that, let's get to the main encore, the main reason that you guys clicked on this video. Let's get to the build. Long before Kerry knew I would be doing this project, he had already started it on his own. The boat was sandblasted and then painted gray with a single stage industrial paint at a body shop. The boat had subfloor, aluminum sheet rod boxes, and framing in place by Kerry and company. The interior work completed prior to drop off was a double edged sword. In this case, it helped because at the time I didn't have aluminum welding capabilities. It did have setbacks though, as the framing was done in one by one, where I would prefer one by two tube aluminum. The main issue was getting all the live well and cooler plumbing in while working around the existing framing and the subfloor. It's easier to design framing around plumbing and fitting routes as opposed to the other way around. In the end, I made it work. I also had to modify framing by adding or removing material, but more on that later. Since I completed this build, I purchased an aluminum welder and personally welded in my first all aluminum welded tube frame. This boat will be my next full build video here on the channel, so stay tuned as the evolution continues. The first order of business was to get the live well in. Carrie had already purchased a live well tank from tbnation.net and I ordered a Flowrite premium live well plumbing kit from tbnation.net. The same live well parts used in top dollar professional fiberglass bass boats. The folks at Flowrite have been big supporters of the channel here and it doesn't hurt that they make the best fittings in the game. I definitely recommend that you check out Flowrite.
With the live oil in, I began working on the battery hatch up front. We plan to run a lid here with a recessed foot pedal tray inset into the top of the lid. To accomplish this, I need a specific size for clearance. I had to nip tuck the bow to give myself ample room. You can see that the subfloor runs uphill here. This is where three batteries would go and I wanted to build a flat platform for them to mount. I got creative with some framing and spec'd out a flat space for the batteries. It's important to note that I kept in mind the battery's dimensions and height to ensure proper clearance from the hatch lid or the recessed tray going inside the lid. Not only did I frame the battery flat, but I had to add framing around the vertical perimeters and corners for the hatch walls to attach to. With framing now in place, I began templating out the interior vertical walls of the hatch. I am a fan of templates because in awkward spaces like this, where there's multiple angle changes or curves, it can be challenging to accurately cut panels off of measurements alone. I use poster paper for the templates, 1 16th angled aluminum for the framing, and 0 060 sheet aluminum for the inside hatch walls. This area became a nice creative use of space and can fit three group 31 batteries, even though Carrie will rock out with lithiums. Having the batteries up front near and dear to the trolling motor helps the boat with weight distribution, especially given that the rear of the boat will be home to a massive 48 volt lithium battery pack for the electric outboard. I installed two inch PVC pipe down the length of each side of the boat to act as conduit to later route wires through from front to back. Next, I began working on the mirrored rod lockers. These rod lockers would be identical on each side of the boat. Each locker would house eight inch and a half rod tubes to accommodate spinning rods and bait casters. I began by measuring layout and then drilling my holes. From there, I added some angled framing to attach some sheet aluminum. I would end up framing and sheeting in a total of four additional panels, creating six quadrants from side to side. Two of these quadrants would end up getting some pore foam, but more on that later. I would hole saw a total of 48 holes for the inch and a half rod tubes to go through. It was critical that these holes were drilled with accuracy and in a straight line. Also, the holes needed to be drilled to the outside diameter of the pipe, ensuring the tightest fitment possible. The pipe I used for the rod tubes is inch and a half interior diameter PVC pipe. I cut them at five foot lengths. In combination with the four foot aluminum box, these rod lockers can accommodate rods up to nine feet in length. I was shocked when I bought the PVC for this project as it was almost $250 for five 10 foot sticks. I slid the pipes into place and they were a tight fit. I used Gorilla Ultimate adhesive around each contact point where the pipe went through the aluminum. I also taped everything temporarily to hold it in place as the adhesive cured. Again, later on, pore foam would lock these tubes into place permanently and there were some finished details to be done inside the rod boxes, but I'll get to that later in the video. For time's sake of this video, I'm just showing the highlights of the rod locker build. There's a ton of thought and detail in this portion of the boat, so for those interested, I did film a step-by-step -step video on the rod locker's fabrication. It'll be out on my channel in the near future. I moved on to installing the cooler. This aluminum cooler tub was custom built just for this project by my friends at TB Nation Outdoors. They have the capability to fabricate custom sized live wells, coolers, lids, and more if needed. Definitely worth checking them out if you need a custom part made or an off-the-shelf item. I stacked and glued two inches of closed cell foam board on the subfloor underneath the cooler. I left a notch cut out for the cooler drain line. Here, I'd also use Flowrite plumbing fittings and hose. The cooler would drain out the side of the boat where I got a through hole fitting as low as possible. The cooler drain line clearance is thought of in advance when designing the cooler dimensions for order. It would feature an inside plug to prevent from backfilling with water. I mounted it to the framing using countersink rivets. I would fully insulate around the cooler later in the project. For now, I temporarily riveted the cooler lid into place. I made more framing modifications by cutting a hatch wall divider to fit a larger lid in place. This hatch would be a large tackle storage area. From there, I began staging, centering, and tacking the center storage lids in place. I added rubber door edging for softer closes and to protect the powder coated anti-flood track finish. Speaking of which, you can see that all the lids were powder coated in a matte black finish. Next on the agenda was modifying the front battery hatch lid to accept a recessed trolling motor foot tray. First, I drilled the hole for the flush latch. Then I measured my cutout and then the old Makita made a guest appearance. As you can see, I hit the full send button and cut through the lid, the hat channel and all. After some cleanup, I installed some tube aluminum for support and some meat to mount the recessed foot tray to. 
I told myself after the El Diablo build that I'd never put a recess tray inside of a lid again due to the amount of work and execution required. Well, I guess I lied because here we are again. You can see here the welded hat channel underneath the four foot rod locker lids ensuring there's no flex. I had to notch the lid track lip to get a flush fit with the center lids overlapping the framing. I bounced to the cockpit to properly rivet down the floor, something Kerry and his cousins had forgotten about. From there, it was time to complete some framing in the back of the boat as the framing was left unfinished upon arrival. Now with the framing in, at this point, I switched up my build plan. The boat would get custom router turf, but there is a three to six week turnaround after placing the order. To order, the boat has to get scanned, and to scan the boat, all the lids, decking, and aluminum work need to be in place. So to expedite the process, I decided to get all the sheet aluminum in temporarily, get the boat scanned, and then while we waited on the turf to be manufactured, I could get back to work on the final details of the boat. For the decking, I'm using 090 sheet aluminum, and there's a variety of ways that I cut my shapes. Sometimes I measure, cut the part big, make adjustments, make some marks, and then I cut off the excess. For more complicated shapes, I'll make templates. The shapes for this boat were pretty simple, so no templates for the decking were needed. To cut the aluminum, I'll use my sheet metal shears or a circular saw, depending on the cut and the accuracy needed. For more precise fitting, I'll use a grinder with a paddle wheel to shave and finesse material for a jam up jelly type fitment. I worked on the live well surround decking. The goal for me is to use the least amount of deck parts as possible. The less deck parts, the less joints. The less joints, the stronger the deck. But also because this boat would get custom turf, there would be turf breaks or gaps separating the individually routed EVA foam parts. Wherever there's a break in the turf parts, the aluminum decking will be exposed. So this means my sheet aluminum work would need to be as tight and precise as possible. This accurate aluminum work takes great time and care, but in the finished product is a detail most people commonly overlook. I always say it's all the things that you don't see that make what you do see in the finished product look as good as it does, cuz. I began work on cutting and mocking up the trolling motor mount. As if the recessed foot pedal tray inside of a lid wasn't enough, I started working on mounting a seat base inside of the next hatch lid. 
This was planned in advance as the lid was reinforced with quarter inch aluminum plate on the underside of the lid. I also temporarily mounted the rear seat base as well. Everything that the turf decking would go around needed to be in place for the scan. Just like that, everything was mocked up as it would be in the final product. It was time to scan the boat, and lucky for me, I got some cousins that make house calls. My good friends Chris and Ryan from TV Nation Outdoors Southeast offer services to scan boats and provide custom turf orders. They use specialized equipment to create a digital footprint of the exact layout and dimensions within a boat. The footage you are seeing in this video is the process of them scanning the interior of Carrie's boat. And sorry for the 480p resolution, Chris messaged me this footage as the boat was actually scanned while I was on vacation at the beach. Once everything is scanned, the information is sent to Southern Cooler and Marine based out of Louisiana. Go dogs! They are authorized SeaDeck dealers and known in the industry for some of their show-stopping custom turf jobs. They would come up with a design with Carrie's input and custom route and manufacture the turf. If you're in the Georgia or the Southeast area and are interested in this custom sea deck for your boat, you can hit up the boys at Tiny Boat Nation Outdoors Southeast or myself and we can help your boat stand apart from the pack. I started taking the decking back off to begin adding more framing back in. The boat would need angled aluminum ledgers the length of the boat to catch the decking edges, so I began installing those. These would need to be custom bent to the angle of the hull. The framing spans up front were not sufficient to support the decking without flex, so I added extra framing within the voids. And man, looking back, I really wish I had the capability to weld aluminum at the time of this project because riveted aluminum framing is tedious. Knowing what I know now, I don't know how I did it without a welder, but I've always found a way to make it work. I began sheet aluminum vertical wall work in the back hatch area. I also worked on gluing closed cell foam insulation board around the perimeter of the cooler. This was one to three inches in depth, depending on the space available, and would also get some pour foam later. I know, I know, it's not a Yeti, but I did the best I could with the materials and space available to provide some kind of insulation. With the aluminum decking back off, some framing, foam, and hydro turf ready to go back in, it was time to start rough wiring in some lighting and accessories. I got these really cool tackle tray dividers custom made for this project. They should be available for purchase in the near future. I measured out and began cutting hydro turf for the hatch bottom. I used grooved sheet material hydro turf for inside all the compartments. I cleaned properly with alcohol, then I stuck the turf for a tight fit. I then installed the drain for the anti-flood track. This goes through the subfloor and directs water from the deck 
through the subfloor to the factory drain channels and the bottom of the boat. Then I installed the tackle tray dividers. This is the hatch where I cut out the middle wall earlier in the video, turning two hatches into one. Now you can see why, as we were able to fit three dividers in place, which can hold up to 15 tackle trays. Remember those panels I made for the front hatch? It was time to pop those back out and cut in access panels to the wire tubes. I cut these identical on both sides. The covers screw into place and when removed, allow maintenance access to the two inch wire tube exits that run the length of the boat. Note that I put these toward the front of the panel so when the batteries are mounted, you still have access to them. Later on, I will vinyl wrap the covers themselves. I then measured out hydro turf for the front hatch, cut out the odd shape, and then I got that in place. It was time to do some pour foam. This is a two-part mix from US Composites and it expands when the parts are mixed together. I typically don't use pour foam in my projects, but this was the time and the place for it. It can add buoyancy, rigidity, and insulation. I walled off the quadrants around the rod locker tubes that would get the pour foam with foam insulation board, making sure to tape all the cracks and seams, essentially encapsulating these areas. The pour foam in these quadrants would lock in the rod locker tubes permanently, ensuring that they would never move or come apart. I'll cover all this in great depth in the rod locker build video when it comes out, so stay tuned for that video. I was able to pour foam around the perimeter of the live well, adding some insulation to help our little green friends have some stable water temperatures in the event of a tournament. With the pour foam in around the live well, I then reinstalled the lid permanently, added a bit of framing, and I capped it off by installing the decking surround with countersink rivets. Lastly, I used some pour foam around the back cooler area voids where I could get it in. From there, I was back in the rod lockers for finished details. I started by figuring out how big the rod rack would be and where it would go. I then made a template. I then made that template a reality by cutting it out of sheet aluminum. And you only thought that 48 holes drilled for the rod locker was enough. I didn't stop there. We needed 10 more for the rod racks. These holes are in line with the front, middle, and bottom holes, allowing the top holes rods to rest on top of the rack. Demonstration later in the video. I sanded and added angled aluminum edges to mount the rack in place. Then I wrapped it in this unique carbon fiber wrap and added some rubber edging around the rod holes before permanently mounting it in the locker. And as always, you could see that this part had a jam up jelly tight fitment as I had to use a rubber mallet to finesse it in place. Speaking of finesse, I got crafty with my small razor knife and cut out the hydro turf covering the flush mounted rod tubes. This was new for me and I really like the clean result of the hidden tubes opposed to your traditional exposed rod tube that typically overlaps the turf. I turfed the rod locker floor next and another thing you probably wouldn't notice without me telling you, but the grooves in the floor turf are perfectly in line with the grooves on the vertical front and back walls of the rod lockers. For the walls, I chose gray hydro turf to give some contrast and depth and from there I just needed to mount the front lids and add struts where needed. A few of the lids will get struts. Unfortunately for me, struts aren't really a plug and play item on these aluminum lids. So I had to create a custom adapter or spacer for the struts to mount to the lid track. This thing is bad to the bone. Check this out. Here's rod locker number one. Oh, got your strut. Boom, yeah. Then over here. Dual rod lockers in the house, and this kind of just tops it off. Boom, shaka locka. Yes, yes, yes. Did the wrap on all the struts kind of make it pop? Would you just look at it? Sometimes you just got to look at it. Look at that, dude. Unbelievable. It was time to install and wire in the flashlight LED light strips. These are high quality, 100% waterproof lights. For this boat, we did four foot strips for the back deck and six foot strips for the front deck. We could have easily done lights the entire length of the interior rail, but our goal was to light up the decking with just enough light to fish comfortably at night. More is not always better, and lighting in this boat was more of a function over fashion modification. All right, guys, at this point, the boat was rough wired in, live well and plumbing were finished, cooler was in, framing modifications and additions added, foam was in, electrical accessories installed, Custom dual rod lockers were complete, hydro turf in all the hatches, and all the lids were permanently mounted. Finally, we were now back to the same point that I was in earlier in the video. For the last time, I can now permanently install the aluminum sheet decking.
Real simple here, I'm taking the O90 aluminum sheet and with one drill, I run my 3 16th inch hole. With another drill, I run my countersink bit and then I use my Milwaukee battery powered rivet gun to pop the rivet. I'm using a lot of rivets here to attach the decking anywhere there's framing. As you can see, I prefer to run my shot back as I go to keep the metal shavings from getting everywhere inside of the boat especially the finished product inside of the hatches. For this boat, I sanded all the decking parts before installing them in the boat because certain parts of the decking would need black paint work before installing the custom sea deck. You'll see what I mean and why in a bit. I added some framing in the switch panel cockpit wall, and then I made a cutout where the custom switch panel will be mounted into that wall panel. And speaking of custom switch panel, here's some shots of what I cooked up in the lab. If you followed my channel long enough, you know every boat I've done has gotten a custom panel made by yours truly. I take great pride in making these, each one unique to the project. It's tedious and a lot of measuring, but one of my signatures to my boats. After cutting this one, I wrapped it in some wrap I used elsewhere throughout the project. While at it, I also wrapped the seat bases as well. I'll tell you what, it's always something. I had to modify a barbed through hole fitting by cutting it so it can accept a 90 degree threaded fitting to attach a hose to for the recess tray drain. This would kick water out the side of the compartment into the channels underneath the rod tubes and subfloor. I mounted the seat base in the back with bolts through the framing, and then I mounted the seat base up front inside of the hatch lid. It had been a lot of hours and work to get to this point, but the boat was now almost ready for the custom routered sea deck turf. Sea deck material is EVA foam. It's closed cell, water and stain resistant, and it dissipates heat. Even the black color stays cooler to the touch than traditional bass boat carpet. There's many advantages to running this material in the boat. With the turf in from Southern Cooler and Marine, there was two things left to do before I can install it. Number one, I had to lay the turf out in the boat, figure out where the turf breaks would fall, and then tape those areas off and paint with black paint. Raw aluminum reflecting through the turf breaks on a black sea deck job would not look like a professionally finished product. Number two, I'd need to tape off all the deck edges and then run a bead of black silicone along all the edges to prevent water from penetrating the deck surrounds. We would prefer to control where the water is routed and don't want it slipping past the edges of the deck. With these two things done, I could then install all 33 pieces of custom sea deck. A few notes before we move on. I skipped over the final wiring of the boat. 
reason being the final wiring on this boat was featured in full detail in my recently updated wiring video here on the channel. It's a step-by-step -step tutorial that covers everything wiring that you would need to know to rig up your boat. Check it out for more information. I did fill and test the live well before Sea Deck and everything worked great. Unfortunately, I forgot to get footage of the live well in operation after the boat was 100% complete. So for what it's worth, this is the test footage. With everything complete on my end, I hooked old girl up and hauled her to awesome Dawsonville, Georgia to drop the boat off with Carrie. Carrie is actually one of the owners of 400 Inc., which specializes in signs, graphics, and vehicle vinyl wraps, including boats. The boat would be wrapped in-house by Carrie and PJ. Before the wrap, though, the boat would head directly across the street to Sonar Pros for the electronics installation. Carrie told me from day one that Trent, the owner of Sonar Pros, was a good friend of his, and Sonar Pros would be responsible for hooking up the rig with graphs, trolling motor, and talons. Uh, now that it's you know that uh, brigade's done with it, uh, it's going to go to Trent Palmer at Sonar Pros, do all the custom rigging, and uh, hook up the electronics, and then I personally, with 400 Inc, is going to wrap the boat, and uh, that'll be it. It'll be done. I dropped the boat off and came back a few weeks later for the wrap install. In the meantime, Sonar Pros have worked their magic. They are no strangers to the game as they rig up tons of professional bass anglers boats every season. The 1852 got stack graphs up front in the form of a Garmin 106 SV with Live Scope Plus and a Lowrance HDS Carbon 9. It got a 36 volt Minn Kota Ultrex and three powerhouse lithiums in the front hatch. There's another HDS Carbon 9 in the cockpit on a balls out mount. The two talons are on the tail end of things behind a massive 48 volt e propulsion lithium battery for the e propulsion electric outboard. There's another powerhouse lithium battery in the back for the electronics, as well as some kill switches and Sonar Pro's wiring harnesses. There was a lot of work and attention to detail that went into the rigging by Sonar Pro's, and I'm sure that my quick walkthrough just doesn't do it the justice that it truly deserves. But with all the electronics upgrades now in place, it was time for the 400 Inc. A-Team to wrap the boat in a custom vinyl wrap. The boat would get two layers of wrap. First, a diamond white wrap by Avery, and then over that, a 3M clear wrap with the custom printed pattern on it. Hey, what's up? If you guys remember, Carrie had the boat painted gloss gray before dropping it off with me and months and months prior to the boat getting this wrap job. He wanted a smooth gloss finish to wrap over, but also needed the paint to cure properly before applying the vinyl wrap. It's recommended that anything that's painted cures for at least 30 days before wrapping over it. And this is because the chemical makeup of the paint will continue to change during the curing process, sometimes shrinking or expanding and solvents even evaporating from the paint. Long story short, don't wrap your boat or anything else directly after paint if you want long lasting results without peeling wrinkling or discoloration within the vinyl. All right, go ahead, go down. There you go, there you go. Right like that. There you go, had a girl. With the diamond white base down, Carrie and PJ then apply the three imprinted clear. I'm not gonna pretend to know their craft or explain their techniques, but it's very obvious that they do this for a living and are good at what they do. There's a few things you need to know about Carrie if you couldn't tell already. One, he likes the color orange. Two, he's a Miami guy. Hence the homage paid in his build for the elusive tarpon he loves to chase in South Florida within the wrap scale pattern and in the sea deck. Another Easter egg hidden within the wrap is an inside joke of Carrie's, his fictitious tackle shop, Test Tackles. I'll let you ponder that one.
Well, off to the next one, cousins. One last detail added after filming concluded was a new trailer. The tracker trailer seen throughout this video was simply for the boat build out and transport. Hey guys, I wanted to introduce to you the newest member of our family. This is Rowdy. He is a little ball of energy, but we are super excited to have him. What is it? I know. I also want to give a special thank you to all my sponsors for believing in me and their support of the channel. So special thank you to everyone at TB Nation Outdoors, all the boys at Six Sense Fishing and Waterland Fishing Optics, everyone at Mac Boring and E Propulsion, 400 Inc, Brunt Boots, and everybody at Flowrite. Without your support, this wouldn't be possible. Rowdy wants to get down, and I think that he just farted because it stinks. We'll catch you guys on the next one. And of course, a massive thank you to you guys for supporting the channel and following along on the journey. I hope that you guys will tune in for the next full build made right here in Struggleville, Georgia. You just gonna sit there and film? Uh huh. Yeah. Everyone at 400 Inc. At <sighs> you fart. But I do appreciate, you know, you, you knocking it out. It's done right. It's done.